decisions to make between laws that are based in kind of cultural ideas and laws and norms that are based in religious doctrine. Religious doctrine comes from an in, unbelievably awesome being who's like way beyond human understanding, infinitely wise, and if you disobey this being, you go to hell forever. That is substantially different from the idea that, well, it's kind of culturally traditional that we think these things. A huge number of the changes these guys are trying to implement will not just normalize, because these people have fundamental opposition to them. That's something significant that the proposition bench has missed, and that's something that I'm going to talk a bit more about in a useful rebuttal. Well, two things. First thing, I need to explain why this actually makes the EU much worse at giving global political capital to its members, which is essentially one of the significant things it's there to do. Secondly, I'm going to explain why it's incredibly difficult for the EU to access and gain more members, and more member states, specifically in areas where they want to access these countries like the most, right? Why it's actually particularly difficult for them to try and get access to these countries and try and change things in these countries. Firstly, four points of Russell. One, the idea that we get from property that they're better off when we've kind of got these legal changes. Three responses to this. One, you get this like problematic narrative that the problem is solved, right? You have your legal equality, we don't need to do anything else. It's particularly problematic at the point where the legal equality hasn't come through a change in social perception. But it's been imposed by an overarching body, right? At that point, you definitely don't get the political capital to change things in terms of the way in which people think. Secondly, the idea that when people feel persecuted, they are much more likely to feel like an aspect of their identity, in this circumstance, religious identity, is under threat. At that point, they're not just going to sit back and allow that identity to continue to be limited and continue to be persecuted. They're going to be far more active in trying to impose their ideas and impose their uh, and, and be more kind of uh, imposing and more aggressive in terms of explaining why they think these things and in terms of pushing the political elites within those countries to make those changes. Particularly important is that these traditional people tend to come from the kind of upper middle class background, right? Which means they have much more political capital than the kinds of minorities you guys are trying to help. But the point where you make these particular political elites much more in, much more aggressively trying to change these things is so that the Next thing, no thank you, the idea that they won't leave because they don't care enough, right? So it's just essentially misunderstand a huge narrative around the EU at the moment, right? They particularly don't like when, it, when sovereignty is taken away from them. The point where we live in the UK, there's going to be a referendum, and a huge number of people are likely to vote UK, I vote for leaving the EU as well. Because it's problematic for these guys to say, well, the EU is really great, and people won't leave just because they love the EU. You don't think that's true. Because at the point where you take these things away, they're going to be upset. So still a couple of things from the extension, this idea that they become normalised. This is a fallacy in so far as there is a huge gap between what is legal and what is moral in the country, right? Just because tax avoidance is legal doesn't necessarily mean that society deems it to be moral. The way where something becomes legal doesn't mean that society will suddenly deem it to be moral, or even deem it to be moral over time. They haven't explained why that's the case. Nextly, there's a tension in the case. First, because they say, look, we need to respect what EU citizens want. And secondly, they then go on to say, look, the people in these countries, though we can't, the countries themselves can't change it because people don't want it, right? Very clear tension there. Either a country has that either EU citizens want these changes to happen, or they don't. What we would say is that significantly within the EU, the countries where people where, where broadly people within the countries want these changes to happen, they can happen within those countries. In countries where those changes are not supported, we would say it's much easier for, for um, the EU to try and push those changes, which we'll come on to later in a more organic way, as her uh, early in or something. Like that. Right, skin substantive. So where does great perception in the EU? But, uh, so, yeah, why this makes the EU worse, uh, like, represents me globally. Right? So one of the great things about the EU is it's made up of relatively small countries. What it can do is, through a collective action, make the EU and the individual EU countries much more relevant on a global political stage, right? The problem is that the EU has never explicitly said that it is against, like, anything beyond just, like, the human rights that is but it's broadly agreed upon, like, important, right? So what we say is that when the EU says, look, we don't just want you to not persecute homosexuals, what we want is same-sex marriage, then that goes against doctrines that are much more entrenched. That goes against ideas that political and religious elites within the country that are particularly important just cannot agree with. This places, um, this places the EU in opposition to countries, like huge numbers of countries in Asia, huge numbers of countries in the Middle East, huge numbers of countries in Africa. What that means is that they're much less likely to be willing to engage at a global political level which means the EU is no longer able to give that political capital to these smaller countries, which is one of the reasons why it exists, right? It significantly decreases the ability to engage with these countries. So the country is not going to be able to get political capital to actually engage with the EU, at the point where the people within that country and the elites within that country hate the EU, because the EU has explicitly said that they don't like the things that they're doing, and they're willing to impose upon countries which, have, which share their values, a completely different value system, being that problematic. We are already uh, in opposition to a lot of countries in the Middle East on a 
values and on human rights, why does this create a marginal change that's important? So this is where the distinction about religion is particularly important. But broadly, this is where the distinction about entrenched values is particularly important. We say that the level of human rights that is expected by the EU is not something which goes against the very core of the identities of elites in these countries. What this does, it says that you need to give homosexuals marriage in your churches, right? And that will all like marriage to some degree. At that point, people say, well, we don't want to do that. Because we, as, like, our religion tells us that, like, homosexual marriage, that gay marriage is bad, and it's the marriage should be between a man and a woman. There's a holy union, right? That's much more significant, and that's why that's, that's a uh, big fun factor, right? Secondly, the uh, idea of, like, the growth of the EU. Because broadly, the EU is likely to want to have more countries in it, have more member states in it, grow into it, grow towards the East. So that point, it's able to do more stuff and to affect more people, right? What we say is that this kinds of, these kinds of changes going to particularly affect countries which do not fall in line with the kind of values that you see in the UK, in Germany, and in France. Well, it does is it creates a perception that the bar is incredibly high if you want to join the EU, and the bar is set by the dominant countries within the EU, right? That means that you have to share the values of Germany, of France, of the UK, to, the, to, a, much, to a far greater extent than under the status quo if you want to be a part of the EU. What does that do? significantly hinders the ability of countries to actually go ahead and fulfill these requirements, right? I can think of a reasonably recent example where trying to fulfill much less uh, stringent requirements caused problems for a certain country when it wanted to join the EU, right? So like, at the point where these, the, the requirements are much higher, they go against much more important doctrines, you literally make it impossible for countries like Turkey to be able to join the EU because they have to completely overhaul the kinds of entrenched narratives, the kinds of entrenched principles that the political elites in those countries have. What that means is it is much, much worse for the people that we're trying to help. Because the people that we're trying to help are much, much more persecuted in the countries where there are these kinds of diametric oppositions to these principles, right? It's much harder. There are, there are far more people who are persecuted in Turkey than there are people who are persecuted in France. We make it much harder to access the people in Turkey just so that we can help the fewer people in France. We say that it's much, much worse when you look at the way in which the EU wants to function, the way in which the EU wants to affect the world, so it makes the EU a much less capable place for us to be. Probably she's an incredibly proud of it.